Okay, well, let's get into the sermon because I'm going to run out of time. So when she asked me, when Linda asked me what it was about, this title just kind of popped in my head. Prayer or pray? And so let's talk about that. Do you want to be a prayer or do you want to be pray? Oh, yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, be with us as we uh, contemplate your word. and Be with my tongue as I speak what I feel you've laid on my heart. Lord, I pray that it brings uh, glory to your name. Lord, forgive me for being uh, such a weakling. And forgive all of us for our failures. And I pray, Lord, that uh, I just pray thanks for being so merciful. I pray all this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm a little flustered today. I've got, got a lot on my mind. Anyway, okay, so 1 Peter 5, 7 through 8. Casting all your cares upon him, for he that care, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So Satan is the devil, same guy, right? Satan is going around like this roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is looking for prey. And that's not P-R-A-Y, that's P-R-E-Y. He is looking for prey, and he will pounce when he finds it. So that's kind of where the title came from. You know, do we want to be a prayer, or do we want to be prey? When we're facing an enemy, the best thing to have is armor, right? Uh, weaponry, right? And there's one text in the Bible that talks about this, and we've talked about it before, but it's one of my favorite passages, so we're going to talk about it again. <laughs> All right? And that is Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. It tells us about the armor of God. We have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the belt of truth, and the shoes or the well, according to what century you're in, there might have been sandals of the preparation of the gospel. But that's only six items. Did you notice that? It's only six. And I mean, you need all those to protect yourself, sure, right? No, no doubt about it. But it seems like there should be one more. You know, we don't hardly ever go with six. Now, six would be the things that you know, you work six days, so these are the six things that you put your hands on, right? You would use the Word of God, right? You would wear the helmet. All these things are things that you uh, do. There's a lot of action involved. Now, I'm not saying that God isn't helping us. Obviously, all of them are uh, mute without God. But they are kind of things you do. So are there only six? Are there only six items to the armor of God? What do you think? Huh? We've talked about this before. <laughs> so, the armor of God. Let's look at it one more time. We're going to look at the text. We'll start off with Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. And you can read along if you'd like. Um, so, let's see here. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you... The whole armor of God. How much of the armor of God? All of it, right? That you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. So what the evil day would be is the day that the lion comes to eat you, right? That's an evil day. Verse 14, stand therefore having lo your loins girt about with truth. Okay, so that is a belt, the belt of truth. It's holding your britches up, okay? You don't want to get caught with your pants down. So, you know, I, I know some of these young kids nowadays, they, they don't wear belts. I, I don't wear a belt a lot of times, but I do keep my britches up, and some of them don't. Uh, let's go on. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. So there's a breastplate of righteousness. By the way, where did we get that breastplate of righteousness? Is it our righteousness? No, it's Jesus' righteousness, right? It's the righteousness of Christ. And we have to wear that. Okay, verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
So now we have the shoes, the shoes of peace, or the shoes of the preparation of gospel, being ready to go and share the gospel. Okay, let's look at verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So that's pretty, inter pretty, pretty important, right? That's why he says, above all, have your faith, your trust in God, right? That's your shield. Okay, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. So now we have a helmet and the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So that's six items. But there's actually another verse, and I like to include it. A lot of people don't. Just like that graphic that I showed you before, I didn't make that graphic up. Somebody else made it up, and there's six items. And it's kind of sad to me that they overlook verse 18. Because our verse 18 is going to be very important in what we're talking about today. So let's look at it. Let's look at verse 18 as well. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all per perseverance and supplication for all saints. So not only are we praying for ourselves, but we're praying for the saints. So now you could say, well, that does, that's not really an item, but isn't it really? Isn't that one of the seven items here? And so I would say that the seventh item is the seventh item of the armor of God is prayer. And what's interesting is the seventh idol, I, idol, not idol, seventh, seventh item. My tongue is not working this morning. That seventh seventh item is resting in prayer. So it's almost like a picture of the Sabbath here. You know, you got you got six items that you use, right? You wear and you. You move your shield around and you have this breastplate on. But that seventh is turning to God and resting in his power. All of them are from him. Don't get me wrong. They're all in his power. But that one especially is resting in the might and power and mercy of God. I think that's pretty cool. So what does that have to do with uh, fighting this lion that's trying to eat us? All right? Well, let's look at that. Mrs. White says some very good things. Uh, uh, Linda said, you should look at uh, uh, Steps to Christ. So I looked through there and I was like, wow, there is a lot of stuff in this chapter. There's a whole chapter on prayer. It's called the privilege, I think, of prayer. And it is a privilege. Think about it. Would it be a privilege to go before the president? You don't get to do that normally, so that's a privilege. Would it be a privilege to go between, uh, between go before a king on our, on our world? Yes, that would be a privilege. Now imagine who you're going before when you pray. The king of the universe. The king of all that exists. Not only the king, but the maker of all things. Pretty cool. So it is a huge privilege to be able to go before our Lord. So look what she says. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. You make yourself pray. P-R-E-Y. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin. And it is all because they do not make use of the privilege that God has given them in the divine appointed, appointment of prayer. Wow. Wow. You know, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I forget to pray a lot. I forget a lot of things, but, you know, you just get busy and you're in your day. Usually it's when something really scary happens that you start praying, right? Or something bad. And that's not, should that be when we pray? It sounds like we should be praying way before that. Let's continue. There's another, there's a little more. Without unceasing prayer and diligent watching, we are in danger of growing careless and of deviating. That's what I was about to say. Deviating from the right path. The adversary seeks continuously to obstruct the way to the mercy seat, that we may not, by earnest supplication and faith, obtain grace and power to 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 do what? Resist temptation. Wow. I need to pray more. What about you? Let's go a little further. 
We may choose every door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. Um, we may close every door. I love it that you guys stay on top of me. We may close every door to impulse, imagining. Wow. Okay. Rewind. Let's start over. <laughs> no, I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> yeah, let's blame it on that. Uh, we may close every door or every door to impure imaginings and unholy thoughts by lifting the soul into the presence of God through what? Sincere prayer. So not just prayer, but sincere prayer, which means what? It's it's from the heart. It's honest. It's true. Yeah. So, in essence, what she's saying is you can be a prayer or you can be pray. Hmm. I used to have a sticker uh, on my locker at work. I, I don't remember where I found it, but I thought, oh, that's cool. I like that. So I stuck it on my locker. And this is not the sticker, but it, it was a graphic I found online that says exactly what the sticker used to say. I don't know where the sticker went. But this is what it says. Seven days without prayer makes one week. And that's not W-E-E-K. It's W-E-A-K. I used to have, I love that sticker. Uh, but I think somebody might have peeled it off. I had to give that locker up. But anyway, long story. But isn't that true? You know, you think about it. If you go, if you just wait till Sabbath to pray, you're in trouble. Because you're going to be weak. And that is very true. So, what is prayer? Should we kind of, I mean, we're, we're talking about it and we assume everyone in here knows, and we probably do, but I think it's healthy to look at our definitions every once in a while, right? And I like to see what Mrs. White says about it because I really like uh, her definition, uh, also found in the same chapter of uh, Steps to Christ. So let's see what she says. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. I like that. So God, through prayer, we should be honest with God. Isn't that, that I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I find it, I find it to be quite a relief when I can be honest with somebody and I know they'll still love me. Do you, do you agree with that? I hope that you guys know I'm that way. I, I love every one of you, and I will no matter what, right? Uh, unless you mess with my kids. Anyway, oh, no, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so, I mean, that's important. An open heart. Man, I love that. So the story that popped in my mind when I heard that sentence, or a couple sentences there, the story that popped in my mind, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and I know you know it, but when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's, he's waiting on, you know, well, yeah, I, I guess more or less he was waiting to be arrested, right? And what, what does he pray? He says, uh, Matthew 26, 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh, my father. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Never, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So here he's, he's in this terrible situation. And he could have like, you know, Jesus could have pretended that he's strong, and which he was, but I'm just saying, and, and he is, I should say. But he, he could have pretended like nothing was wrong. and oh, I'm, I'm all right. Man, everything's cool. But he doesn't. He's, he opens his heart. He's honest to God, the Father. Isn't that cool? And this picture, to me, this picture is really not honest. Honest because he's all kind of like, mm, you know, and they got the little halo on him and stuff. I don't think Jesus walked around with a halo. I mean, if anybody would, he would, but I don't think he did. So I like this other picture. I found this, and I think this is more realistic to what it looked like. You know, in anguish, you know, uh, just throwing himself on the ground almost and, and praying. I really like that picture. Okay, so what, I mean, excuse me, how should we pray? 
you know, we, we talked about uh, what prayer is. It's, it's talking to God like you would a friend, right? Of course, with respect, lots of respect, because he is the king of the universe. So how, how should we pray? And I, I think the chapter, again, I'm drawing from this chapter a lot because there's a lot of good stuff in it. So look what she says. But to pray in the name of Jesus is something more than a mere mention of his name at the beginning and ending of the prayer. You know, we all say, uh, in Jesus' name, amen, right? It is to pray in the mind and spirit of Jesus. Think about that. We're praying as he would pray. We're praying with his uh, motivations and his heart. Well, I just showed you where he prayed that he wanted to live. So there's nothing wrong with that. But what was at the end of that prayer? Yeah, not my will, but your will. So if we're going to pray with the mind of Christ, yeah, we may pray something that sort of looks selfish. I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't call it selfish, but it's kind of self-focused. We might pray that, but we also would pray in Jesus' name, which means by his authority or as he would pray. In other words, your will be done. That's what you're saying. When, when you say in Jesus name, I don't know if you realize it, but you're saying your will be done, not mine. Um, it might be better to just say that, but that's pretty well what you're saying when you say in Jesus name, your will, not mine. And so she's saying we have to pray with that spirit, with the, the, the mind and spirit of Jesus. Now I'll continue. Uh, while we believe his promises rarely a rely, excuse me, upon his grace and work his works. So think about that. We're praying in the mind and spirit of Jesus while believing the promises, relying on his grace and working his works. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, there's more. Look at this. Look at this quote here. And I just kind of picked them through the uh, through the chapter. When we come to ask mercy and blessings from God, we should have a spirit of love and forgiveness in our hearts. Think about that for a second. We should be think. you know, there, there may be somebody we're angry with. And she's saying, you really can't pray right if you're carrying baggage around, you're angry with somebody. You know, if you have unresolved, uh, you know, uh, feelings of, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a uh, grudge, a grudge you're holding. Okay, Let's, I'll continue. If we expect our own prayers to be heard, then get that. If we expect it to be heard, we must forgive others in the same manner and to the same extent as we hope to be forgiven. And uh, the, you see where it's dot, dot, dot? She actually includes where Jesus was talking about um, uh, that, you know, you have to forgive those. Uh, you have to forgive if you want to be forgiven. I, I've, I've left that out because I didn't have room. Right, right. Right, exactly. Right. Right. That's, and that's what she was quoting, exactly. Okay, let's go to the next, next uh, quote. Our devotional exercises should not consist wholly in asking and receiving. I think this is an easy rut to fall into, isn't it? We, you know, Lord, help me, and, you know, and that's it. Let us, but, but let's go on with the quote. Let us not be always thinking of our wants and never of the benefits we receive. We do not pray any too much. In other words, we can't pray too much, right? But we are too sparing of giving thanks. So how often do we pray and we get what we needed and God takes care of us and we move on? You know, it's kind of like when you do something nice for somebody and they just you know, walk off. And that, that's kind of, should we treat God like that? We shouldn't even treat people like that. But should we treat God like that? No. So she's right. We should, uh, our, our prayers should have a lot of thanksgiving in them. I'm very thankful for the little girl that was born. Uh, all healthy, you know, really healthy. <laughs> but anyway, that's a huge blessing. Okay, now here's another question. Where can we pray? What do you think? Where? Anywhere. Anywhere? Is that what you guys? All right, let's see what Mrs. White says. There is no time 
or place in which it is inappropriate to offer us up, excuse me, a petition to God. So in other words, you can pray anywhere. There is nothing that can prevent us from lifting up our hearts in the spirit of earnest prayer. In the crowded, in the crowds of the street, in the midst of a business agreement, we may stand, uh, excuse me, send up a petition to God and plead for divine guidance, as did Nina, uh, uh, Nehemiah. Yeah, thank you, Nehemiah. <laughs> Yeah, reading's my second. uh, Anyway, Uh, as did Nehemiah when he made his request before King Artaxerxes. I got that out. A close, a closet of communion may be found wherever you are. Think about that. So you you know you're. I like her idea of in a business engagement. So you're 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 um, going to buy a car, and you're standing. You know you're talking to the guy, and you're like. Well, I'm just going to buy this car. Or you could be like, you, could, you instead you could say, really, you know, silently to yourself, Lord, protect me from being swindled, help me make a wise decision. You know, you could pray, right? Do we do that? I bet you guys do. I'm not sure that I do. So it's something that uh, I'm going to have to do better at. Here's another prayer. Now, uh, Okay, listen to this. We should have the door of the heart open continually and our invitation going, yeah, invitation going up that Jesus may come and abide as a heavenly guest in our soul. And that's page 99. So how should we pray? We should pray in the family circle. Now think about that. That means your family. You should pray with your, your closest all, all your family, but especially your family circle. I would include the church when, when we say that. The family circle is also your church. True, true, of course. But we, we don't want to neglect our, fa- our church families either. But yes, the family circle is that core in the house, but also your church. And above all, we must not neglect secret prayer. Now this got me. I was like, huh, yeah, that's a really good point. For this is the life of the soul. So secret prayer is the life of the soul. It is impossible for the soul to flourish while prayer is neglected. Family or public prayer alone is not sufficient. In solitude, let the soul be laid open to the inspecting eye of God. Secret prayer is to be heard only by the prayer of Prayer, hearing God. So she's saying we should have time that nobody else hears our prayers. That's, you know, if you think about it, no one else in the universe can read your mind. They don't know what's going on in your heart unless you tell them or unless they guess by your actions or guess by, you know, what what you're looking at. You know, that's the only way they'll know your heart. But God knows your heart simply because he can look into it. He understands that he, he can be there. And so uh, she's saying we should have secret prayer. No one else in the universe should or can be where God can be in our hearts. And that's pretty cool. I like that. You know, uh, it gives him a very unique position in our lives. And if we neglect to spend time with him in prayer, we're really missing out on a, on a wonderful relationship, aren't we? I mean... It's kind of like knowing somebody that's really awesome and never calling them or spend any time with them. You're like, why don't I ever hang out with this guy? He's really cool. I mean, that's how it is. I don't understand why, we, why we're like that. I mean, why I'm like that. All right. Now, the, it said it was prayer and fasting Sabbath, right? Hmm. Why fasting? Matthew 17, 14 through 16. Let's look at that. Uh, Actually, it's going to be a little longer, but we're going to look at the story. All right, verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is he is lunatic. He's crazy and sore vexed for oft time. He falleth into the fire and he off and oft into the water. So this guy's like falling into water. and he's, He's 
Yeah, he's messed up. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he, sept and he departed out of him. And the child was cured that, uh, from that very hour. So this was a younger person. It was a boy. And so he's cured by Jesus. Verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? Now you've got to remember the disciples were given the ability to cast out demons. They were given the ability, I think, even to cure, to heal. And so they're going around doing these things. And all of a sudden, uh, this man brings his son to the disciples and they couldn't do it. They tried. That's the only way you know you couldn't, right? Is if you tried. And so they tried, but they couldn't cast the demon out. And so now they're confused. and uh, They've done it. And the reason they're confused is they were already doing this. They had, they had cast them out, but now they couldn't. And so they asked Jesus privately. You see, that's why it says the disciples to Jesus apart. So in other words, in private, in private, they said, why couldn't we do it? And look at Jesus' answer. Verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Okay. But I have verse 21 on. So let's see what verse 21 says. How be it, now Jesus is continuing here, how be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So wow, uh, fasting is kind of important. Now that's hard on a fat boy like me because I like to eat. Okay? So, hmm. But you know, there are more than just fasting in the sense of eating, right? So let's look at that. We'll look at that. So fasting and prayer. You know, as Seventh-day Adventists, are we a fasting church? What do you think? Do we fast? I'm going to say yes. And I want you to think about this for a second. We fast. Unlike most Christian denominations, we do fast because we don't eat the clean and un or we don't eat the unclean. So think about that. That's sort of a fast in the in the comparison to the rest of the church. Uh, and I mean churches in the worldwide, all of people that claim to be Christian. Most of them eat whatever they want. And so in their eyes, we kind of do fast. But I'm going to take it a step further. If you practice what our church teaches in the full extent, which I don't completely, still having trouble with cheese. I love cheese. But if you do, we're kind of fasting in that sense too. Think about uh, Daniel and his three friends. They fasted in a sense, right? Because they wouldn't eat the king's meat. They only ate veggies. And so it's almost like here in the last days when things are getting really rough and the lion is going around and eating everyone, that doesn't pray and fasts. Is our church, are, were we told to, to um, abstain from meat because it's a type of fast? I think that's kind of interesting. A, a church that's, that uh, the whole congregation or most of the congregation is fasting their whole life because they abstain from eating flesh. I think that's pretty cool. Something to think about. What do you think? Hmm. But that's not the only type of fasting. And, and by the way, it's good to fast periodically. I, I was talking to my doctor. Uh, he, he's Hindu, but he said, yeah, it's good for you to fast. I thought, well, that's interesting. It's actually healthy for you. But it's also spiritually, it's, it's healthy to fast. But there's other kinds of fasts. Look, let's look at Isaiah 58, 6 through 8. Look what he says here. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? This is God speaking uh, through Isaiah. 
to loose the bands of the wick of wickedness. In other words, get rid of your sins, right? To undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that, that, uh, that are cast out into thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. In other words, your family. You don't hide yourself from your family. You help them. So this is the fast that God's talking about. Now, once we do that fast, the fast of looking out for others and not ourselves, because really fasting is 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 uh, turning away from your own needs. Huh? Right. There you go. Self-denial. That's a good way of putting it. That, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Fasting is self-denial. So this is a fast, too. Do you think our church should fast this way? And look what he says in verse 8. If we follow the, the fast that God is talking about here, verse 8 tells us, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. And look at this. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. That's a pretty cool fast. Did I say something wrong? Oh, reward. Oh, re reward. Yeah, okay. I may have, I may have. Oh, reward. Okay. Mm, new one on me. I'm going to have to look, look at that. Now let's look at James because I think this goes in line with that type of fast. Pure religion and undefiled before God. This is James 1, 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless. Now think about that. People, children that don't have a father and the widow in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So, in other words, live holy and take care of the fatherless and the widows. So again, that's, that's the kind of fast that I believe we need to do. And I'm not saying don't do the food fast. Obviously, that's good for you every once in a while. And again, we, I think we live a life of fasting when we practice the vegetarian diet. All right. Let's look at one more quote from Mrs. White. Our Heavenly Father waits. Now listen to this. Our Heavenly Father waits to bestow upon us the fullness of his blessing. It is our privilege to drink largely at the fountain of boundless love. What a wonder it is that we pray so little when we have all that, all that is uh, there for us. Why, why don't we pray more? Continuing with her quote, God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children. And yet there is much Manifest reluctance on our part to make known our wants to God. Isn't that something? And that's not wants like, I want this, I want that. That's wants like, I need this. You know, he, you know, like he's measured and found wanting. In other words, he's found needing something. So the question is, how do we keep from being prey for the enemy? By being prayers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come to you anytime, anywhere, and, and just pray and talk to you as a friend. You know, we don't deserve it. I know I don't. And so I am just, just dumbfounded that you are so merciful and so loving that you're always willing to listen to those who come to you sincerely and humbly and I know that we need to forgive and so Lord I pray that you'll help us to do that some of us struggle with it I know every once in a while I do too help us to forgive those that have wronged us not to let it eat at us but to give it to you and let you heal our hearts and heal the wounds I thank you Lord so much for all these blessings and for always being there for us I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.